Hello, this is Andy Beachy of Adventure Surf Ministries, and we are at the shack, the Adventure Surf Shack. Um, and we're here for five days this week as part of the Bluegrass Good Giving Challenge. Please consider giving to BG, BG.Gives. Um, and uh, today I'm dialoguing with a good friend. Um, uh, why don't you tell me, uh, tell them who you are and our connection a little bit. Uh, my name is Caleb Phillips, and uh, I have known Andy for, so I've, I think since 2002, uh, when I started at Asbury, he was a professor there at the time. He was my outdoor leadership professor uh, for a semester or two and had a bunch of classes with him. And then uh, I lived in an apartment with six other guys uh, my senior year, and Andy was our house mentor. <laughs> he would come in and eat our food and uh, have family dinner <laughs> with us. I've been mooch for a long time. Uh, yeah, I always wanted some egg foo young. I remember that. Uh, uh, yes, it was uh -huh. good times. So yeah. I've known Andy for, for a, a, a long time now, and uh, we've kind of overlapped in Wilmore or in Jesmond County a few times and share a love of hiking and things like that. So mm. he always points me towards the unknown trails. Um, but I'm excited today to talk a little bit about what I do um, in Jesmond County with at-risk youth and young adults um, and uh, just young people who, who don't always have uh, families that are able to uh, provide all the things that they need and, and kind of the relationship stability that, that they want and need. So, um. Yeah, and, and uh, Caleb, you know, it, youth ministry, there's a lot of different ways we can... Uh, practice youth ministry. Adventure Serve practices youth ministry because most of our church groups that come are youth that are wanting to do service work. Um, your focus is a certain type of youth and, um, and a certain style of ministering to them. Tell us what that looks like, how long you've been doing it, and, and how you find uh, those youth to serve. Yeah. Um, so I was in uh, traditional youth ministry for seven uh, or eight years, actually longer than that, but um, I, I was working with churches and I always um, was connected to an alternative school here in Jesmond County, the Providence School, um, which is uh, the school for um, that, that has a lot of kids um, that are not being successful for lots of different reasons at uh, the traditional schools. And so I had started working there right out of college. And then um, through relationships there, I was bringing kids into um, my churches and they were just never connecting long term. It just didn't seem like it was the right fit. Um, and so five years ago, my wife and I felt um, like God was leading us to step out on faith. And so we kind of stepped out and just began serving um, teenagers and young adults that were marginalized in the county um, that were on the fringes, um, kids that, that really didn't fit into any mold. They weren't, um, in, they weren't on sports teams. They weren't in traditional schools. They weren't going to youth groups or churches. And we wanted to find ways to connect with them, um, serve them, and, and ultimately point them to Jesus um, and, and give them relationships that they could count on and people to walk through um, not only their teen years, but after walk with them long term. So that's what that's what we do. We've been doing it for a little over five years now. Um, in Jesmond County, we have a, a church a house church that meets on our house on Sundays, another one that meets on Wednesdays in Nicholasville, and then um, from basketball ministry at the Providence School to um, you know Bible studies and coffee at McDonald's with lots of different guys through the week. Um, that's kind of how I spend my time. Describe maybe, uh, I mean, without putting names on it, um, some, of the, some of the young people that are part of this church that meets in your house. Like, is this like 15 people? Is this, uh, how many people do you jam into your living room yeah. for this? Uh, it, it fluctuates over over the years. Um, it's been anywhere from 15 uh, to 20 people to um, five to eight people. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it depends on the season and what's going on. Um, but uh, most of those young people have um, come from um, the alternative school or their their friends that they've invited, um, and, and they're um, they're usually people. Um, when we started, nobody that. Um, that was in our church had ever been to church or was a believer. So it was, the only mm. people that were believers were my wife and I. Um, and since that time in that five years, we've seen over 30, 30 some people come to Christ, young people under, under the age of 20 um, and be baptized and, and, and walking with the Lord uh, and then you know, ministering to their family. Um, and so uh, they're not, they're no different, um, the kids that we work with than normal youth group kids, except for most of them have experienced trauma 
Um, they, their home life has not been good. And so um, they've been exposed to things or gotten involved in things that um, just haven't led to good things. And they're heading in a direction that isn't gonna lead to good things. And so we try to just make space available. That's kind of our thing. We don't have, we're not experts or, or, or we don't have all the answers, but we, we know that we can make space available in our home and in our lives um, to just have conversations with people um, that are hurting or that need a place and then um, and, and point them to Jesus, point them to God, and then also to maybe some getting, getting some resources and some skills that can help them um, have a better quality of life. How does, how does the issues of either substandard housing or homelessness intersect with this population of kids that you're, young adults that you're working with? Yeah. Well, a lot of the teenagers that we work with, um, they, they, they're just very transient. So they'll move, um, their families move from house to house, neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, they might move to Lexington for a while and then move back. They might move out of the county for a while to, to Somerset or to family out of state. And then they're back um, because they're just not a lot of job stability. Um, and then a lot of times um, when those kids get 17, 18, they want, you were that talking about that, how just like, as soon as they can, yeah. they want out of the house. They they're out. just in a difficult how, home family yeah. situation. The, they just need out, they've but they're only yeah. 17, they, 18. There's lot, they're, they're under an emotional strain all the time. Um, there's trauma or it's just not a healthy environment or they think I want to be able to do what I want. And, and the little restrictions that they have, they see that they could go somewhere else. So they immediately either move out with a boyfriend or girlfriend or they um, go crash on somebody's couch as soon as they turn 18 and, and they're out of that. Um, sometimes they've been in foster care and they, they're just out anyway at 18 and they're just um, going there, with the- It sounds like they're f almost fleeing either an emotionally unhealthy, yeah. unsafe, or physically unsafe yeah. environment in their home. Yeah, so they gotta get out, they gotta go somewhere. We've had, um, it, it, it's one of the, the hardest issues that we deal with is that we've had instances where there's been abuse, um, whether it's physical or emotional or something, and that that young person they have to get out of there. Um, but there's no, there's oftentimes it seems like there's no good option, and, and really a lot of times there's not. Um, and then so when we're in a position where we'll have sometimes we'll have a Christian person um, that has space in their house offer to take that person in, but for someone that's been in uh, just a kind of a crisis situation their whole life to go to somebody they don't know and move into a house with them, there's no way they're gonna do that. Mm -hmm. Like that, that, like they, they're, that's scary. That's like, why are you doing this? Why would you do this? So a safer situation usually for them is like, I'm just gonna find a boyfriend that, that will like, let me come live with them. Like it's an older guy, whatever, or, or maybe it's an okay guy, but I just gotta get out, right? And they, nobody can afford a place by themselves. So two or three people end up, we're gonna, you can come share our rent, come move in here. And then that oftentimes leads to, sometimes it's a better situation. It's not the best situation. Sometimes it's getting involved with people who are already involved with addiction or other things. And so that's putting them, exposing them to worse things. Um, but it, it's just, there's a lot, it, yeah. there's a lot that goes into it. It's amazing. I, I Just from talking to other professionals in the field this week, I've learned that there's, the count is somewhere between 300 and 400 people under the age of 18 who are considered homeless. And that's yeah. just the amount that are counted, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's there's many more here in Jesmond County. So tell me a little bit about how your work has improved uh, their situations, um, whether that be physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually, and maybe one or two success stories of your time. And, and then we'll wrap up here after that. Um. Well, I think that the thing that we provide, and at least we try to, there's a lot of organizations like the homeless shelter and different organizations, community action that provide tangible solutions. Um, but a lot of times the people who need it, especially the young people who need it, have no idea how to get connected with that. And, and I can't imagine a 17 year old entering a shelter where there's 30, 25 no. year olds in a- And it happens. We've had, we, we, we've had kids living at the Jesmus, not kids, but young 18 year olds and it, it's a worse situation sometimes with them. A mass shelter yeah. situation. And, and so what we try to provide is hope and direction um, and 
a support system, an ongoing support system. So the type it, of things that you find within family when you're 19 and so, most yeah. in most families, so right? So like I started, and I don't know about you, like I started on my parents' shoulders, right? Like I, I know that when I graduated college, even though I didn't, my dad paid the down payment for my apartment in Nicholsville. Like I had to have a security deposit. I had just gotten a job and my dad was like, I'm gonna pay your security deposit so you can move in this week. The kids I work with, there's nobody to pay that security deposit. No fallback there's plan. No, they, don't even, they don't have hope that that could even happen. So they never even go talk to those people in the apartment. They skip that of like, I could get an apartment, like I could get a job and get, it's just like, what can I do to just like have a place to be? So skipping around. So what we try to be is a, a voice in their life, whether it's every Sunday or every Wednesday, or when I meet with them throughout the week that they can they can say, I, I say, like, what's going on with you? Know, what can I help you with? How, like, what, what, are, what are you struggling with? That's a big question. What are you struggling with? And I might find out they've been, they had a place to stay, but last night they got kicked out. And so, okay, what are we going to do? And then once we find them a place, wherever that is, temporary, now what are we going to do? Like, how can I help you from here? Just walk alongside them, so, just being a, a support. So success story, the probably most recent one I can tell you without, without giving names. So I, I had that conversation this um, this summer in July, I found out uh, a couple that we work with, it's pretty closely, um, had lost their home and um, were out on the street and were basically- And you're saying a couple, is this like a dating couple? Mm -hmm. okay. It's just uh -huh. a dating couple. And they're 18, 19, uh, whatever. Yeah, uh -huh. so she's 21, I think. Yeah. Um, so they're, they, I, I, they come to church, they've been coming on Wednesdays and they show up and it's like, we didn't tell you, but we've been basically staying at different houses with our friends for, for a month. Um, what do we like, you know, but we're down, we have not, they want us to pay a little something to help with the bills. We got nothing. Like, what do we do? Um, so I talk with them, you know, I, I make sure they, I encourage them to go to the homeless shelter. They didn't want to do that. So I, we got them a place to stay back to their friends that night. The next day kind of met with them, um, picked them up from where they were, went to McDonald's, talked it through. And then that's when as a person that like, I know lots of people. So I start calling contacts and I find out what this guy can do and I start calling people that might have job opportunities. So I contacted one of my friends that owns like a fencing business and I, I'm like, do you have work, man? What this, this guy's willing to work. He'll show up. I'll drop, I'll pick him up and drop him off. Um, and he, and so he's like, I'll get back yeah, cause to you. Even a ride is yes, transportation yeah. is like the number one thing why we can't get jobs for these kids. You, you need at least 2000 bucks on hand to get a vehicle. I can't tell you how many work. kids have used my car to get their license. Like I teach them how to drive. I take them, they have to, you know, cause they don't have a car. And where did you and I get our first right, car? Right. Our parents. I didn't have to buy a car, you know, and, and, you know, I had to, my dad bought I mean, the car, I had to make payments on it. Yeah. I got a job at McDonald's, right. but somebody helped me go. I didn't go to the bank by myself and do these things. And yeah. And, and so teach them how to drive. But so I call my friend and, and he's like, you know, let me call you back. I'll check. He's like, I don't have anything, but let me make some calls. So he called me back. He's like, I know a guy um, that, I, I talked to this guy, he needs work on his farm. If he can be there tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, like he'll, he can work. So I tell the, the guy, I'm like, are you willing to work tomorrow? Like we can get you, we can, we, we can get you a place to stay. You can go to the shelter or we'll figure out. So I pick him up in the morning. Uh, actually they went to the, the homeless shelter that night and I picked him up in the morning, took him to work at this guy's house out in the country, never been there. Um, he worked all day. I went and picked him up at five o'clock um, took him back, you know, he, he had nothing to eat all day. Didn't realize that, that was my bad. Uh, so I got him some food. And then um, fast forward after a few days, he built a relationship with the guy he was working for. That guy started picking him up, bringing him home. He had, He's like, this they, is a good worker. Yeah. I want this worker what? to get to work, so I'm gonna right. be so, able to so, pick him up. So then the next time I pick him up, he's out there, he's working on a bobcat, driving a bobcat for this guy. And, and, and he spent like about two months, three months working on this guy's farm. This guy, and this is the way God works when we step out and make space. So then I, I, I go to the show to get him one day or to talk to him. They came to church on Wednesday night and he said, hey, we got a place to stay. My boss, the guy I've been working for, is renting us this little place that he has. Um, and, and he's going to do this and he's going to sell me this car. Um, he's going to just like, mm, I'm going to pay it. God. And so he, they're working through this system. So the, then when it got cold, there was no more work for him to do on the farm. So the place where he was renting to stay, there was another business next to them. And he had just gotten to know some of these guys outside smoking with them. And he got a job at this company. And now he's working every day for this company, going out um, and, and doing fencing. And they're moving towards 
Um, they got connected with community action and some other resources they're moving towards getting an, an apartment. Um, so that's, that's a story of like, they got, they're struggling, man. It's still a struggle daily. Um, the reality is with, with all the little things, but they're working towards it. And what that takes is individual people um, being willing to make space in their lives. And, and not just me, but this guy that helped them that said, hey, now that I know you, I've got, I, I, you're on my radar. What can I do to help you? I, I love this story. And, and just to close up and some of the things that you said that touched me was just that if it hadn't been for a person like yourself to vouch for that young man and young woman yeah. and to walk alongside him, show him simple things, um, as opposed to just sharing the gospel with him, sharing the gospel is clearly yeah. what we need to be doing as right. Christians. Um, Yet at this point, they're just trying to figure out food, rental, yeah. and it's just difficult to hear the gospel and feel the gospel unless it's acted upon them in the way that you're doing yeah. it relationally. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. And then resources around here, because there's a yeah. lot of resources, so many nonprofits in this there's county that can serve. There's lots of ways that, things to do to help, but it's connecting the people to those things relationally is the way that we do it and the way that we encourage other people to, to just be available and keep your eyes open. If, you, if you're able to help somebody and connect them to something, that's being the bridge sometimes is such a big deal. And I imagine for that couple, they could be homeless right now if you and others had not stepped in and come alongside Maybe. them. Yeah. Thanks, Caleb. Yeah, appreciate it, man. Good stuff.